and welcome to the Worcester Senior Center Stay Connected Programming on Channel 192. My name is Suki Lapin and I am the Worcester Senior Center Program Coordinator. We have two programs for you to enjoy, focusing on wildlife and your pets. First, listen to the Wild About Wildlife video taped by the staff at the Ecotarium. Many of the animals living on the Ecotarium grounds are not releasable due to illness, injury, human socialization, or other issues. All animals are housed in enclosures that have been specially designed to meet the natural needs of the species as well as to accommodate any physical limitations of the individual animal. All animal residents receive regular checkups from their vets and daily interaction with their caretakers. With a goal to spark a deeper understanding to environment and ecosystems, Ecotarium wildlife staff and museum educators lead experiences and programs with many of the resident wildlife on a daily basis. Visit the ecotarium.org to learn about their friendly neighborhood residents. Next, learn about the Worcester Animal Rescue League's Pet Food Pantry that provides a pet food and supplies to existing social service organizations in the community. Meet Kristen Mullins, Executive Director, who in March 2020 started providing many local seniors with pet food and supplies. Seniors were the first group she targeted outreach to given the additional risk COVID-19 presented to this population. Through food pantry partnerships with the Worcester Senior Center and St. Paul's Elder Outreach, pet food and supplies are distributed to hundreds of seniors in need. Should any senior need support with their pet, we encourage them to contact the Worcester Animal Rescue League at 508-853-0030. As part of our Senior for Senior Adoption Pet Program, Worcester Animal Rescue League is delighted to offer a waived adoption fee for older pets over 10 years old to senior citizens. In most shelters, older animals are usually overlooked by people searching for a younger pet. The haste to walk by an older animal is a senior's gain because older pets have so much more to offer. Remember, if you need any assistance, please call the Worcester Senior Center's main desk at 508-799-1232. Leave a message and we'll get right back to you. Stay safe. Stay hydrated and stay connected by watching Channel 192. Welcome to our mountain lion habitat. Here we have siblings Salton and Freya. They're about a year and a half old. They were found orphaned as kittens in California and brought here to the Ecotarium because they couldn't survive on their own in the wild. Salton and Freya really enjoy chasing each other around the enclosure and staring at our resident wild turkeys when they come by. Mountain lions used to be native to the area, but once early European settlers came around, they saw mountain lions as a threat, so they couldn't be around here anymore. If you're sticking around, you might have some trouble finding them because they really enjoy hanging out really high up. So if you can't see them down low, try looking up high. to the Ecotarium. This is Ralph. He is our resident turkey vulture here at Wildcat Station. He is three years old and he is with us because of a wing injury that he said he sustained when he was younger. Ralph's favorite food is rat and fish. Vultures like dead and decaying things. Um, turkey vultures have a wingspan of about six feet which they use to glide up in the sky and soar. 
instead of flapping their wings. Ralph's favorite thing to do is to perch and put his wings all the way out and sun himself. This helps keep him warm and helps keep his wings nice and clean and dry. Welcome to our raven habitat. Our two ravens, Jan and Poe, are very social and intelligent animals. You can often find them hopping around their habitat, either interacting with one another, enrichment, or foraging for food. Keepers really like to exercise their intelligence by hiding food around their habitat. This challenges them to watch and remember where keepers have chosen to place things. Welcome to our red fox habitat. Sox is our resident red fox and he's a very smart and resourceful animal. Foxes are omnivorous, which means they source their diet from both plants and animals. Here at the Equitarium, Sox gets a variety of food, including fish and rodents, as well as fruits and vegetables like apples and carrots. In the, their native habitat, foxes will be foraging for their food. So keepers use special enrichment items like foxes and wobble feeders to keep socks active and his skills sharp. teeth that are filled with iron to keep them nice and strong. They do grow continuously so he has to chew on wood in his habitat to keep them short. Uh, his favorite food to chew on is sweet potato and he does have specialized hair called quills that he uses for self-defense. screech owl habitat. In this exhibit we have one screech owl, his name is Marvin, and a lot of people have some difficulty finding him, which makes sense. These screech owls blend in very well to their surroundings. He most often spends his time up in this house in the left corner, so if you are looking around and you don't see him, definitely just peek in. Uh, they do a very good job standing still and just kind of looking like tree bark. So here at our Screech Owl Habitat, we have some new additions. They are not new to the Ecotarium, but they are new to this exhibit. So we actually have opened up our skunk habitat to the outside. They now share their habitat with Marvin, our Screech Owl. We have two skunks here at the Ecotarium. Their names are Misty and Stormy. Stormy is our standard black and white skunk, and Misty is what is called apricot coloring. So she is a white skunk. If you're looking for them outside, they're most often gonna be in their logs sleeping. Hi everyone, welcome to the Upper Pond. So this is one of my favorite places to look out for birds at the Ecotarium. So 
There's a lot of red-winged blackbirds that you'll hear around here. Um, other native songbirds like sparrows and warblers. And if you're really lucky, you might see the green heron or a great blue heron or even a belted kingfisher. Other things you might see in the water are some frogs and turtles. North American River Otter Habitat. Our two resident North American River Otters are named Slidell and Daisy. Slidell is our male and he is 13 years old. Daisy is our female and she is three years old. The best way to tell them apart is that Slidell is bigger and has more white fur around his face and neck. North American River Otters normally eat lots of different types of aquatic animals like amphibians, uh, crayfish, and shrimp. Uh, Slidell and Daisy's favorite food is fish. Uh, North American River otters are adapted to live in New England weather conditions. Um, in the summer, both otters can be seen swimming in their pool, and in the winter, they can be seen sliding around in their habitat on their bellies. So the meadow is a great place to stand and observe some native flora and fauna. We have lots of native plant species right here, things like red clover, lots of native grasses, and really importantly, milkweed. So milkweed you might know as one of the main food sources for the monarch butterfly, which are a really important pollinator. So when you're standing here, kind of looking out at the meadow, keep an eye out for lots of species of butterflies and moths and insects, but make sure you keep your eye out for the really beautiful monarch butterfly. All right, welcome to our bald eagle habitat. Here we have two very special birds, Diane and Bob. They're diurnal, which means they spend most of their time active during the day. You'll see them basking up on a perch in the sun or bathing in their natural pond. You can tell them apart not only by their location, but how they look. So Bob dwells mostly on the ground and he has an all white head, while Diane will be mostly up in the high perches and she has a white head with brown spots they'll fade away as she ages. Welcome to our barred owl habitat. Our two barred owls are named Blanche and Rose, and they live with us because they have eye injuries that would make it difficult for them to hunt and thrive in the wild. Naturally, barred owls eat rodents, but they will also eat fish and crayfish. Here at the Ecotarium, our owls still work for their food by participating in positive reinforcement-based sessions. They are trained to touch a target, step on a scale for weights, and even step on a keeper's hand so they can stand at the front of the habitat for chats. to our lower pond area. Here you will find lots of different types of critters. We've got amphibians such as frogs here. We also have lots of different fish species such as white suckers, pumpkin seeds, creek chub. And we also have a resident snapping turtle who lives in here and every spring she will come up uh, by an area of lower wildcat station uh, to lay her eggs. So keep an eye out for her as well. One of the best days I've ever had, about a month after I started the Ecotarium, is when this little guy showed up on my desk. I was given a random huge box of skulls. I couldn't have been happier. This, uh, at first glance, might look like a human skull, but if you look at the brow ridge and the ex especially long canine teeth, this is actually a chimpanzee skull. Uh, they share 98% of their DNA with us, that's closer than horses and donkeys. This is the skull of an albatross. This is the family containing some of the largest birds on planet Earth. Uh, we are not entirely sure of what species this animal is, 
but Albatross's wingspan can be up to six feet wide. These are fossil crinoid stems. I'm not sure if you can see the iridescence, but these are the stems of a prehistoric animal related to a jellyfish, but instead of floating free like jellyfish do, it grew on stems at the bottom of the ocean. This object is a dolphin jaw. One of the things on it that's unusual is that it has this scrimshaw carving of a ship. A friend of mine who is very interested in the Age of Sail says that this is an American ship, which you can tell by the massiveness of the timbers, and that it was after the Napoleonic era, which you can tell by the set of the sails. This is a very well-observed portrait of a boat. This is probably a an engraving of the boat that the person who was carving this was sailing on at that time. And any of his crewmates would probably be able to recognize this as a specific ship. Canids are my favorites. Dogs, wolves, foxes, and all of their kin. I love them. This is the skull of a gray wolf, Canis lupus. Uh, it's difficult to tell from just a skull, but this would have been a seriously large animal. This, meanwhile, is the, the skull of a red fox. Uh, similar to socks, who we have here on the grounds, although apparently this skull was collected in 1955. This is the skull of a domestic dog. This is a mounted specimen of a domestic dog, uh, again, also from sometime in the 1950s. You can tell the difference between a wolf skull and a dog skull, and indeed the skull of any other canid, because dogs... Dogs are mutants. Humanity has, has shaped dogs to meet our needs over the millennia that we've been together. Dogs have much shorter muzzles, relatively speaking, than wolves. They have taller foreheads. Their foreheads are more upright, and their eyes are larger in relation to their faces. This is because humans have selected dogs for something called neoteny or similarity to babies. People like things that look like babies. We like dogs with sweet faces and short noses and big eyes. Uh, dogs, in relation to wolves, dogs actually have uh, two more sets of eyebrow muscles that enable them to pull the puppy dog face expression that we all know so well. That, Humans do a lot of communication with our eyes, and dogs have followed along with us in that so that they can more effectively beg for treats. Uh, with Easter coming up, for those of you who are interested in keeping your beautifully dyed Easter eggs all year long, uh, it is possible to drain the contents out of an egg by drilling a small hole in the top and a rather larger hole in the bottom. Uh, this egg has been made so it will look nice on display. If you want, you can do the holes right absolutely at the apex and absolutely at the bottom. You drill a hole, you push a pin or a chopstick or some other long, thin thing in through the egg, sort of scramble it around in there to break up the yolk, and then you blow just as hard as you can. Uh, your eardrums will pop, and a whole bunch of egg goo will come out of the larger lower hole. And then you can keep your decorated egg forever. Be prepared to crack some eggs while that. This is a tun shell. T-U-N, meaning large barrel. Uh, it is really large for its species, but it's not quite museum quality because it has a broken spire. Uh, the broken point removes some of the information that could be provided about the animal's early years when it was very small. But it does uh, let me grab onto it like a trumpet and go, ah!
This is the upper and lower jaw of a walrus that the tusks have fallen out of. These tusks would be mounted in here like this while the animal was alive. What just entertains me endlessly about walruses, in addition to their tiny little eyes, is the fact that their noses are almost solid bone. I would have thought their noses to be squishy, cartilaginous, you know, kind of soft like a dog's nose. But no, their noses are solid bone. What is this? What, what is this? In the Ecotarium's 200 year history, uh, we have unfortunately collected a lot of things that are not labeled. It drives me wild since it is my professional duty to make sure that we label all the things. Given, however, the presence of a little clamshell and the terrible smell, I believe that this is a chunk of marsh grass or possibly seagrass. So another collection that uh, we're working on at present at the Ecotarium is our historical technology collection. Uh, our intern Alham Alkuheli is working on taking down information on the microscopes. We've had these microscopes just forever. The Ecotarium has existed from for almost 200 years now. And this microscope has a repair ticket from 1954. It looks to me to have been even older than that. Uh, but these are all just tools that we've used at the Ecotarium, the Worcester Natural History Society. And we've had them around so long that they've become historic technology. So now we are working on categ cataloging them, categorizing them, figuring out where they came from, how old they actually are. My favorite is this one right here. This is a Bosch and Lom from uh, sold in Rochester, New York, originally manufactured, I believe, in Germany. They still make optical equipment and indeed contact lenses today. This is a compound microscope in that it has two different optics that can be bought, brought to bear. This is the higher power optic and would give you a closer magnification. I'm looking forward to learning what Alham finds out about the development of microscopes. They started out as simple hand lenses, magnifying glasses, then two magnifying glasses held one over the other, and then all of this apparatus in between to ensure precise and reproducible results when looking at something under, say, 100 power magnification versus 200 power magnification. Lately, there has been a lot of interest in how birds can reflect the effects of climate change. A study by Brian Weeks out of the University of Michigan uh, found that birds have been shrinking in response to climate change. Weeks was working with birds from the Field Museum at Chicago, but because the Ecotarium has existed in one form or another since 1825, our specimens are maybe somewhat older than those found in the Field Museum. So one of my interns, Sarah Ismail has been making a project of really pushing to get the last of our ornithology collection online and has been categorizing uh, these woodpeckers, red-headed woodpeckers, for comparison to Weeks data.
Massachusetts. And I'm here with Axel and Brenna and Melly. And our inmates are here is Steve and Alex. Alex. And uh, Hillary will be talking in a minute to who runs this program for us. But I just want to say that this is a program that has been extraordinarily successful for our department. We're in our two and a half years now. Uh, we have had 43 dogs in the program, including these three, and we've got up to 40 adoptions because Axel here's uh, already been adopted by one of our officers. So what we found in this program is it does three things. It really helps the inmate, which is a really critical part of what we do. The idea of rehabilitating, uh, of, of getting people ready to re-enter the world on the outside. The, the, the bonding that they have with these dogs is really exceptional and it helps them uh, very much in, in, in their own development and, and upon release. Uh, the, the stress level inside, according to the officers and Hillary, has dropped dramatically with the dogs here. They become adopted and part of the whole family of the block. So the entire block benefits from this. The officers feel safer, the inmates are safer. Uh, and finally, the idea of having these adoptions and these dogs that have slight behavioral issues uh, come into our facility and they're trained by these uh, these inmates for about 12 weeks and at the end of those 12 weeks they're ready to to be adopted and their their slight behavioral issues have, have usually been resolved really well so I want to just reiterate this is a great program for correctional facilities uh, and at this point I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that. Um, as the sheriff said I've run this program and I've been in this building for over 16 years now and it really has been a great thing it's a great stress reliever for those of us who work here but especially for the guys um, it helps as a stress reliever, but also anxiety wise. I've had many guys tell me that the dogs help them just to, you know, maintain their cool and relieve that anxiety. And, and it is a stressful environment for all of us here. So the dogs do a great job with that. And they're just a, a lot of fun too. And it's a win-win for all of us, uh, staff, inmates, and the dogs alike. So it's been a lot of fun. Hillary, one thing, where did you, I know the answer, but I wanted you to explain, where did we get the partnership for this program to get the dogs? Uh, Second Chance Animal Shelter, and they've been wonderful. They've been a great partner to us, and really, I couldn't thank them enough for all that they've done for us. Yeah, they've been great. And Steve, would you like to add anything? Yeah, my name's Steve. I've been involved in this program for about three months now. Um, Ashley's actually my second dog, and it's really therapeutic for me. I don't know if he helps me more, I help him more, but um, it, it's wonderful seeing him come in traumatized, some of them, and you know, malnourished, and, and to watch their character grow and build themselves up, and to grow and develop over the few months I have them is an amazing feeling. It's wonderful to watch them, and it's a, I can't say enough about this program. It's a wonderful program, and uh, I really appreciate it. Before, How much time do you have? Uh left to surf. I still have 11 and a half months. So you're probably getting some more dogs. Yeah, hopefully. Absolutely. Great. How about you, Al? I'm Alex. Um, I've been in the program for a little over a week. Mm -hmm. um, just just become Melanie's primary. Uh, so we're getting, growing a bond mm -hmm. right now. Um, <laughs> I, I really enjoy the program. Um, I wrote a letter to <coughs> Hillary. I'm sorry. I wrote a letter to Hillary yeah. and, and I asked her to be a part of the program because I wanted some uh, some level of giving back, you know, mm -hmm. uh, have something to do constructive and positive in my time, um, as well as uh, therapeutic for myself, you know, struggling with uh, depression and anxiety, you know, the combination of therapy and medication, and, and this is this is an amazing program. I mean, I can't say enough, but, you know, just the, the calmness that the dogs, you know, and, and, and allow me to feel and you know I can give that back to them you know it, it has been beneficial uh, yeah I really appreciate it well I uh, thank you all I mean this is a program that you know we believe in we're committed to and uh, I think you've just heard some testimonials the fact that everyone should have a program like this mm -hmm. if it's possible Absolutely. because it works and it helps everybody thank you